Hey, welcome to Palm Sundays. I'm Nathaniel Bozolich. Uh, first of all, thank you for being patient with this next video. I'm currently traveling through Australia, so I'm shooting this in my hotel room in Melbourne. Uh, we're talking about the genealogy of Matthew uh, today. It's the very first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. It's an interesting read, and I think as a Christian, you have a tendency when you see a genealogy just to skip straight over it. It's just a bunch of names pointing me to a historical reference of time where I'm led to a place where I need to get to, which is like understanding, okay, Jesus and all these ancestors. Uh, but I think if you do that with the genealogy of Matthew, you miss what Matthew is actually doing with his genealogy. Um, they are the ancestors of Jesus, but you can clearly see that Matthew is picking and choosing specific people to represent ideas, themes, principles um, of who he thinks uh, Jesus is. So let's go a little bit deeper into understanding the genealogy of Matthew. He opens up with, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, the first thing that stands out is understanding Jesus Christ. Christ comes from Messiah, which is a Jewish idea. Uh, it means anointed one, and it really made reference to anointed kings. So Matthew is immediately saying Jesus is king. Uh, and he is the anointed king that the Jewish people have been waiting for, that the prophets spoke about, about a king who's going to come, who's going to rule and reign. And Matthew is saying, this is the king that we have been waiting for. Uh, what's interesting is when you see that he says, son of David, son of Abraham. And his presentation of that is fascinating because we know that Abraham came before David, but he says David first and then Abraham. So David was a king, uh, the greatest king that the Jewish nation had. Um, they were at the height uh, of their kingdom um, in Israel when, when David ruled and from David things would collapse, which we'll see uh, in the genealogy presentation. But it's interesting that he says David first and then Abraham. Abraham is obviously the father of the Jewish nation. Uh, God made a number of promises to Abraham and we'll go through that quickly just so, so you can get some reference. But what I find interesting is the sign that will be placed on the top of Jesus' cross. It says, here lies, or here is Jesus, um, and the charges that were written against him, which was king of the Jews. So David is a king, and Abraham, obviously, the father of the Jewish nation, king of the Jews. Here is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, king, son of Abraham, Jews. So the king of the Jews, and you see how that comes full circle. Um, now, some really interesting things to point out throughout the genealogy is that Matthew makes references to Gentiles that lead to King David and I think that's a really important thing for people to understand that Matthew is pointing out that that in Jesus ancestry line was Jewish and also Gentile people um, so he's not just a king for one group of people but for all people so what's um, important about understanding these two figures uh, both David and Abraham is going through sort of just a brief sort of history of these two people and understand how God interacted with them and the promises God made, which I think are important. Um, so Abraham obviously was the patriarch of the Jewish nation, um, you know, living around 1900, 1921 BC, which is a long, long, long time ago. But, but the promises God makes to him are fascinating where he, he says that, yes, you're going to be a father of a multitude of nations, but um, I will make a nation uh, of you and from that nation kings will come and it will be an everlasting covenant. So you see that God's establishing this idea of kingdoms and kings and from Abraham a king is going to come and this is going to be an everlasting covenant. So something that is going to last forever. Um, we go through that and we see that there's the other two promises. So, so in um, Genesis 17, 1 to 14, God promises Abraham a specific piece of land, which is uh, modern day Israel, Palestine. Uh, and then in Genesis 22, 18, God makes a very, very specific promise to Abraham. He says, uh, all nations will be blessed by your seed. Now the seed is singular. Um, so someone is gonna come from Abraham's line, one person and through that one person, all nations will be blessed. I think it's a really, really important thing to understand as we work our way through to Jesus. Um, the promises made by God a long time ago. Now, when we get to David, we know that he was a shepherd, he was a warrior, he was a poet, and he was a king, a great king. Um, he was chosen by Samuel to be the successor to King Saul. You'll find that in the Old Testament story. Um, 
Now, what's interesting is in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 14, God says this, I will establish his kingdom, build a house for my name, and establish that throne of his kingdom forever. So again, we get this idea of forever. God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham about kings and kingship. And then he makes another uh, everlasting covenant with David saying that, again, from you, from your line, a king is going to come who's going to reign and rule forever. So it's really important that, that, that Matthew is connecting Jesus to both David and Abraham. And that's why those are the immediate two people that he presents at the top. Um, you'll see that David's mentioned five times in the genealogy, which is really important as well. You'll also see the structure, which is there's 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from the um, from David to the exile, and then 14 generations from the exile to Jesus. Now, if you read that and think that's a historical thing, you're going to miss again the point that I think Matthew's trying to make. And what's also fascinating is we read into a little bit that we know that Matthew is a tax collector and we start seeing how he's playing with numbers, which I think is a, a beautiful thing because then we start to see that What's basically happening is we're seeing the personality of Matthew come out in his writing. You know, if he's always dealing with numbers as a tax collector, making profit and taking money from people, and you know, before he started following Jesus, you see that numbers is part of his life and part of his structure. So when he presents his argument for Christ, numbers start to play a part in that. So what's interesting for you to know is that the number 14, um, so in, in the Hebrew language, um, there is a numerical value to um, the letters and the word David is Dawid and the numerical value of the word Dawid is 14. So is that why Matthew so chose to do 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to exile, 14 generations from exile to Jesus, because he's saying, you've got to, he's trying to drill it into our heads that Jesus is king. So any chance he gets, he's going to say king, 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 king. He mentions David a lot. He uses the number 14. So I think for a Jewish audience, they would start to pick up on what Matthew is just trying to beat us over the head with, that Jesus is king. Now, what I find interesting about the, the structure uh, of the 14, 14, 14, you can look at it like this. From Abraham to David is the establishment and the building up of a kingdom. From David to the exile is the collapse of a kingdom. And then you've got from the exile to Christ is the, the true establishment of what a real king is, the real king and the real um, kingdom that will be everlasting. And I think what I found interesting in my own life is and even just thinking about through this idea of Jesus being king, how often have I actually made Jesus king over my life? Yes, I've made a lot of things king over my life, whether it's partners, whether it's my career, whether it's myself, uh, whether it's my, my, my own individual purpose or my career. I've put those things um, and I've probably been ruled by those things and then I found myself at a point in my life where everything seems to have, have collapsed. And the time it takes to build that kingdom is, is equal to the time it'll take to collapse that kingdom. And when you're in that state of absolute disaster, when nothing ever makes sense in your life and you've hit rock bottom, the question is, where do I go from there? What I found in the Christian walk is that people who don't make Jesus their true king, they'll just repeat that 14, 14 pattern where they'll build up their kingdom and then they'll collapse again. And they'll build up their kingdom and they'll collapse again. And I think what Matthew is presenting is, yes, we can all get to a place where we think we're on top of the world and we think we have it all worked out. And then all of a sudden, before we know it, our kingdom slowly starts to collapse and we find ourselves at rock bottom and we don't know where to turn and what to do. And I think what Matthew is presenting here is that when you make Jesus king, that's when you actually become full circle. And it's interesting how Judaism is always about going full circle. So it's 14, 14, 14 to Christ and making him your one true king and it's a really really hard thing to do trust me as a Christian it's the hardest thing you'll ever do is actually dying to yourself and actually making Christ the centerpiece of your life but that's what it would actually look like to consider him your king and when you read through the gospel of Matthew you see how Matthew presents two types of people coming to Jesus some that will acknowledge him immediately as king and the reaction that Jesus has to those people is fascinating and those that reject him as king now, when you read through the gospel, you'll see how Matthew's presenting that. But the most important thing I think Matthew is saying is that Jesus is king. And until you accept him as king, you're only ever going to build up your kingdom to watch it collapse.
Why do I believe that Jesus is in line with this? Is if we turn to um, the Gospel of Matthew, um, chapter 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount. This is the last thing that Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, which is his biggest sermon um, of all the sermons we have presented in the Gospels. And he talks about two foundations. He says this um, in Matthew 7, 24, I'm going to read it out. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like wise men who built their house on rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and buffeted the house, but it did not collapse. It had been set on a solid rock. And everyone who listens to these words of mine but does not act on them will be like a fool who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house and it collapsed and it was completely ruined. It's the last thing Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount. He'll make his way down uh, the mountain from that point. And I think that's fascinating. He talks about collapse. And he talks about this idea of if you listen to what I have to say, and if you follow who I am, then you're going to build your house on a rock. And that rock is the idea that Jesus is the living God, the King of Kings. But if you don't, whatever you're going to build your house on is going to come to a collapse. And what we see is in the genealogy, that's exactly what happens. There's a building of a kingdom, there's a collapse of a kingdom, and there's the, the establishment of the one true king. So I want to leave that with you guys today as you look back at the genealogy and you look through what Matthew is presenting and just ask yourself this question right here, right now. When have I ever made Jesus my true king? It's a hard question to ask and it's a question I ask myself all the time because I have absolutely put other things above Jesus in my life. And those places have led me to an absolute collapse. So the question is, when do I break that cycle? And when do I actually invest in the idea that Jesus is king? And I want to live under his rule and I want to live in his kingdom, which means I need to change and I need to become a citizen of that kingdom. Think about that today. I think that's what Matthew's presenting. Jesus is king. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I hope you got a little bit out of that, and hopefully that encourages you to dig a little bit deeper, even if it's just a genealogy. There are so many incredible principles. One more thing I'm going to say about the, the genealogy before I leave. It's always on God's time, and God knows exactly how things are going to play out. So no matter how much evil we try and produce in this world, God's plan will still proceed. Jesus will still be king. We can't fight it, and God's in no rush. You know, we're the ones that are pushed by time. But God has all the time in the world because he's outside of time. So think about those things today and ask yourself that question. When have I ever made Jesus king and when will I ever make Jesus king, true king of my life? Much love, hope you guys have a good day and I will see you on the next video. Take care, bye.